It's almost showtime in soccer. We trust the YouTube fan because the U.S. men's national team are one day away from their first of their last two friendlies before the World Cup begins, which means it's time to do a special preview for their game against Japan. So hit like and subscribe, and let's get after it. Yes! What is up, everybody? And welcome to David Rajee's favorite podcast in soccer. We trust. I'm Jimmy Trashcan, Cream Cheese, Conradino Conrad, alongside Charlie Chuckwagon Davies and Hollywood Heath Pierce. And we're going to go all in like Pablo Mastriani, one of his patented two-foot tackles, for our preview for the U.S.'s big game against Japan in Dusseldorf, Germany, on early Friday morning. Kickoff is at 8.25 a.m. Eastern time on ESPN2, or Unimas. And this game is one of the two last friendlies that we will have before we participate in the World Cup that begins in less than two months, everybody. Now, before we get into the details, I want a one-word description of how both of you guys are feeling before this game. And Charlie, you're up first. Hyped. I- I'm excited. Hyped. I'm I'm hyped. I love <laughs> yeah. to hear the hype. How about you, Heath? Uh, uh, opportunistic. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. All right. To give you guys some context, this will be the third ever time that we play Japan. The last time the U.S. did play was in February 2006 in a friendly in San Francisco, California. It was a 3-2 victory courtesy of goals by Eddie Pope, Clint Dempsey, and Taylor twelberg Twelman. Now, I started this game when we were up 3-0, and then Heath got subbed on, and we gave up two goals. I don't know, I don't know what's happening here. Heath, please explain what happened. Things, uh, you, could feel the, you could feel the energy shifting, and so they put me on to just like sh- slow it down. We slowed it down to just two goals against, and we're able to see out the win. <laughs> but you could feel like when I came on, you're like, dude, we're going to lose this game if they don't put on some, uh, some support. So I came on. You know, obviously that momentum continued, but we were able to shut it down at two goals and see out that W. You know, all th- we, we got all three points in a friendly, you know. Hey, we call you Hollywood for a reason. You know, you like to make things exciting. So we. we hey, I will. That. Let me let me give an, a, an anecdote on that. I don't know if you remember this, Jimmy. I mean, obviously, <laughs> you're you're, you're hey, from Chris Walken just absolutely crushed Jimmy. Oh Ready? my God! What is it? <laughs> Jimmy's barber aged him ten years with a single cut. <laughs> aged, you, I'm not gonna lie. Aged. You look you look a lot like Ryan Seacrest right now. Oh, Seacrest out. Conradinho out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for everybody that's not watching, I, uh, I am in a hotel room and uh, I comb my hair. And it's not a good look when I comb my hair. I think it looks good. I think, I think it looks solid, Jimmy. Don't, I, don't, I think don't it looks professional as well. Yeah, yeah. I still don't have any in soccer. Which I might just order like one day, one day shipping and just order some shirts on there because somehow <laughs> it hasn't they, come they are yet. not getting to my house. But I don't know if you remember that game, Jimmy. And I know we're going to go into the preview, so I'll make it quick. But we... Um, we were stuck in traffic in San Francisco. We were. And we, they shut down the train lines, the, the BART or whatever the tram is in San Francisco down by the waterfront, so that we could drive down the tracks to get to the stadium. I remember. So they shut it down, and we drove down the middle. It was, it was the most bizarre. I mean, it felt really cool because we had police escorts and everything like that. We were driving down the middle of, of, of the train lines where trains weren't able to move because we were having trouble getting to the stadium. But, you know, for a, for a Northern California kid, this was at San Francisco at, at – um, at where the San Francisco Giants play. And so it was, it was a big moment for me. If they would have started me, I would have gone to the World Cup. So that's their fault. <laughs> Actually, Todd Donovan started. And he didn't go to the World Cup either. So yeah. I, don't know. I don't know what to tell you. I don't, I don't think Johnny Bornstein was around in 2006, but somehow the I, was always, I was always I was always second to somebody. I was always second to somebody. I was just meant to be that. All right. All right. So let's do a little quick breakdown on Japan first, and then we'll get into the U.S. Of course, that's going to be the bulk of who we're going to discuss. But the Samurai Blue are currently ranked 24th in the world. We are number 14, just to give you some context. They're not going to be a slouch in any department. This is the seventh consecutive World Cup that they've qualified for. They cruise through qualifying in Asia, 15 wins, two losses, one draw. And uh, Takumi Minamino and Yuya Asoko were the leading scorers with 10 goals each. The very experienced team. They have, uh, well, they've made two out of the last three round of 16s in the last three, two out of three World Cups. I didn't say that right. With Captain uh, Maya Yoshida, 114 caps in the back. Alongside outside back, uh, Nagatomo's got 136 caps. These guys are like our age, or my age, sorry. And then they got uh, Kawashima, he got 95 caps. And then you got uh, Arsenal Sakahiro, Tomiyasu, Daichi Kamada plays for Eintracht, Rutsu Doan, Freiburg, and Fuhurashi that plays for Celtic. And as I mentioned, Minamino plays for Monaco. Taki Kubo. Obviously, he's supposed to be that big hype of the Japanese superstar when he made his move to Real Madrid a few years ago. Plays for La Real, Real Sociedad now. This is a really quality side. And, and Greg Berhalter actually said, I think that uh, this, this game is going to prepare us for anyone that we face. Japan is a high-pressing team with very dynamic players, very technical players. It'll be a very good challenge. They don't give away many goal-scoring opportunities. The teams play very tight. Everyone gets behind the ball when they lose it. So I think it's going to be an interesting opponent. Any, any thoughts initially on Japan? Charlie, I'll come to you. 
Do you think this is a good opponent for us as we prepare for the World Cup? It, it is a good opponent. What I would like to say, and this is obviously in hindsight, is I, I would like us to be playing the Brazils of the world, the Argentinas of the world, the Frances of the world, the Belgians of the world. But this is a Charlie's good test. Charlie's never happy. Charlie's never he's happy. He's not. He's not. Just, just he's be satisfied, satisfied, Charlie. Never just satisfied. Be satisfied, never satisfied. Be satisfied, man. Ambition. Capital yeah. A on oh, okay. ambition. Okay? Okay. okay? okay. That's fair. But <laughs> what I will say is this is a, a really good test because we should beat Japan. If we're playing our best, we should beat Japan. But this is – they have a number of quality players within the squad. Okay. Heath, any thoughts on Japan? No, I mean, I, I think Charlie summarized it well. Like, if we do – yes, it's a friendly. But if we, if we do believe that we've got this young squad capable of doing something special, we should be able to beat Japan. Yeah, I understand it's a friendly. It's a neutral venue. But Japan are, are, are a good team, right? They, them and Saudi Arabia and their group are the ones that pushed Australia out of, of, of qualifying. Only lost two times in their, in their World Cup qualifying campaign. And, and Japan have always, when I think about national teams and I think about South Korea's and Japan's, and I think about other nations that qualify regularly for world cups, they've always had a very similar system, right? There's always been a, a style or a cultural style of play that Japan plays. They're going to press high, they're technical, Super they're, technical. they're going to be, yeah, they're going to be very tactical as well. And you're going to have to go through those moments where Japan can put together a string of passes where they have the flow of the game. Japan can also uh, d defend uh, collectively, and Counter, you're gonna face, set pieces. yeah, you're gonna face a, a a team that can be sevens and eights consistently. So, do we mm -hmm. have the ability to have a couple players that of moments of magic, or collectively to be able to break that down? If I look at our team, I think we do. It's not our it's not our perfect team. It's not our ideal team that we want to have come the World Cup. But we have enough quality. We have to be able to beat a Japan. Okay, so what I find interesting about both of your comments, and Charlie, I'll start with yours, is if we had a Brazil or an Argentina or a France, there's a possibility there we could get run off the field. And what does that do for confidence? Are we, are we, is that testing us in the right way? I think only England is going to be in a position where they could potentially have more of the ball, whereas I think against Wales and Iran, we might have more of the ball. So then it leads into what I think about Heath's comments. Are we finding the right opponent that's actually preparing us for the three teams we're going to face in our group stage? I know that's easier said than done. It's not easy to go find a like-for-like like replacement for Wales and Iran, but it would have been interesting to potentially find somebody, or England, of course, that, that kind of sets up very similarly. Though, I guess against Uruguay, they had you know, a top striker, Nunez, that, that gave us some challenges, or, or Cavani, that, that would be similar to England and obviously uh, have some world-class players on their team. But that, that's just something I've thrown out Morocco. There. I mean, Morocco. Morocco, is... too. We were yeah. excellent against Morocco, but, but I still... Once I found out they just showed up two days before, that changed my perception on that performance because that's just not easy to do. You're flying across half, halfway across the world, getting your team assembled and showing up two days before and trying to put out a good performance is not easy for anybody, no matter how good you are. And they still had moments where they had some success against us. And, and, and well, I have a, a, a comment because Weston McKinney and Tyler Adams did a, a joint press conference together today, and we'll get into that a little bit. But let's start with the biggest news is that Greg Berhalter has announced that Aaron Long – Walker Zimmerman, Matt Turner, and Sammy Vines are for sure going to be starting tomorrow. And Charlie, I'll come to you on this. Uh, what are your thoughts on Long and Zimmerman as our center backs? It's what we, we we all thought that was going to be the case. Right. I mean, there's no surprises here. We we thought Sam Vines would start at left back. He's the only natural left back we have. Then Aaron Long and Walker Zimmerman, because they have a history playing together, mm -hmm. you're going to go with what you know and rely on. Greg Berhalter, this is not a surprise to anybody. I think what we all uh, thought we, we'd like to see is something different because Chris Richards, it would have been interesting to see if he would have gone with that partnership if Chris Richards was in camp. Mm -hmm. However, you know, Mark McKenzie, we, I think we all knew he wasn't going to play initially at the start. But to me, he has the most – he's probably the most intriguing center back that has yet to really assert himself within the team because of his potential, of his upside. We saw in MLS, he got his move to Belgium. He had, he's had a, a, quite a struggle with the adjustment, mm -hmm. but now it seems like he's found, found his footing. So I, I would like to see him at some point partnered with Walker Zimmerman, but I, I'm not surprised at all. Okay, I, I don't, I'm not overly surprised either, especially given that CCV and Richards pulled out and you're adding two players. So you're going to go with those guys. Now, before I get it to you, Heath, Greg did say that Aaron and Walker are going to play, going to start, and we're probably going to make a sub at halftime or maybe after that and get another center back in. And then the next game, take a look at another one. 
So I'm curious who that other one is. That's first. Second, I got some questions for you. And then I want to hear your thoughts on Sammy Vines as well as our resident left back. But what happens? And this is an area of this is an area of concern for us overall. Like who's our starting center backs? Who's our best pairing? What happens if they don't play well against Japan? Do you, as the coaching staff, say, hey, this is just working out the kinks. They haven't played together for a while, and we're going to give them another 90 against Saudi Arabia? Or at that <laughs> yeah. point, or you honestly, or at that it, you point, can spin it any way you want. Of course you can. But I'm like, okay, but do we want Mark McKenzie and then Eric Palmer Brown to get those minutes when if CCV and Richards come back, those guys won't even be in the team? Like this gets really complicated in the center back position. So I just. I'm gonna throw that that I'm gonna throw that grenade over to you, Heath, and you can pick I, it up look, and run with it. <laughs> I think I think if one of those two backup center backs has an unbelievable game, whether it's a half or they start or they play 90 minutes in one of them and half in another, one of those two center backs could make the World Cup. So I don't think that, and I think that's a CCV thing. I don't think that's a Chris Richards thing. I think Chris Richards is if he's healthy and fit, but CCV with Mark McKenzie and Eric Palmer Brown, if somebody has an absolute kind of blinder of a, of, of, of a, of a camp that shows that they've progressed. You know, my, my conversations with Mark McKenzie this week have been, you've got it. Like you got to show the progression you've had, right? You don't need to show that you deserve to be in camp. You got called in. So whether, you know, you're in, so now you got to show that the player that we saw glimpses of, especially at the Philadelphia union. And we've sort of seen you hit a, a rough patch. You're like a little uncomfortable in the national team. You got to show the, the, the strides you've made. And we right. all know that some of it's about like, Hey, I, I want the attention because I'm playing regularly. I should be called in the national team. And some of it is actual growth. Like, are you better? Are you more assertive? Are you more communicative? Are you are you are you moving at, at the me, speed of the international game? And and, and body one of them, yeah. him. body language yeah. with Mark McKenzie, because sometimes it seems like he 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 feels like he's got to allow everyone else to get the shine, and and he's yeah. just happy to be there. When mm -hmm. as a center back, I want my center back to be like, I'm the boss back here, mm -hmm. and no one's coming in my space. And if they do, they're they're going to feel me. They're, they're going right. to, you know, either take a tough tackle or yeah. I'm going to get on the ball and, and be able to spray it. Jimmy, Jimmy used to Greg always wants. say that. Jimmy used to always say that, but with a much higher pitch voice, you know, he'd be like, you know, <laughs> yeah. a little more like, Hey guys, <laughs> this is my back. I own, I own this back line. I own this yeah. back line. You don't come into my house. Gooch, <laughs> Gooch this is my spot. Yeah. You don't come into here thinking you can uh... score a goal. Yeah, then I got some hair on my chest and my oh, yeah. voice dropped and it all changed yeah. from there. All right. Well, I'm going to throw it back to you, Heath, about Sammy Vines because Berhalter yeah. said this. He, he looks a lot more sure of himself. Aggressive mm -hmm. attacking on the left wing. He's been coming in uh, with, his duel, uh, with his club. He's confident, embracing 1v1 duels, playing out of pressure. He's another mm -hmm. one that's going to start tomorrow. I'm yeah. uh, surprised that Sammy Vines is getting the start because I think there's a shot for Scally that because of his, uh, his versatility that he can go on either side, maybe he's the better like for like replacement uh, like for like Sammy Vines is the only yeah. really left sided player we have on the side. But, but what do you think about Sammy Vines getting oh, to start? I, I think it, you know, it makes sense. He's in good form right now and he's developed as, as a player that assertiveness. Sometimes you need to go through a change in environment. You need to go through a change in pressure. You know, when you, especially some of these guys that come from one club, I, I'm looking at Joe Scally too. He's in the environment of, of the same players all the time. But when you come into the national team, I don't remember feeling good. My first camp or first few camps, Right. You're trying to feel it out. You're like, okay, play simple, connect passes, blend in. You know, when you have your moments to run at somebody or you have your moments to like one on one defend, improve these like isolated things, you want to do that. But you're still thinking, you're constantly overthinking every single thing, right? You're absolutely. And, and, and so to have him now be able to come back in saying, like, oh, yeah, I can play. I've defended top players now. I've been in tough mm -hmm. environments. Mm -hmm. I've played mm -hmm. with some pressure now and, and be able to add that in terms of confidence. That's again, you go to Mark McKenzie, it's a body language thing of that comfort of like, how do I play out of tight spaces? You know, mm -hmm, the decision making mm -hmm. that that showing that you're you're there now and it's no longer like, oh, he could get there. You're trying to prove that you're there. And so it makes sense because he's a natural left back. And I think it may have been Scally had we not seen the injury um, in terms of his role. But now you need potentially eight out and out left back as a backup, right. knowing that you right. might have to call upon that. So Scally before maybe as like a floater, worst case scenario, but maybe this thing has woken Greg Berhalter up to go, Oh, I'm, I, 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 and I, I do think it has woken him up to go, oh yeah, I might need to have another option that we have to go to. Yeah. That's and playing the players, like yeah. yeah play, playing players in their best position and not trying to square peg round hole it. Now confidence also to your point is a hell of a drug. And when you have confidence to the body language and all that stuff, uh, it does make a big difference. So now I'm going to throw it to our resident number nine, Chuck wagon. All these questions that I had for the center back. Another area of concern is the striker position. So if Sergeant crushes it, 
over these two games out wide, let's say, because we saw some training footage that U.S. Soccer has shown on their Twitter handle about he's, he's him being out wide, wide, dropping a dime back post to Ricardo Pepe. He's not playing out wide. Okay, well, let's say that he does. I mean, let's say he does well in those two games. You're going to now take a – you got to go with Sargent at that point? I mean, or is Pepe in the Ferreira experiment, is that done? It's – it's. And then because no. for me, it becomes like it's a form thing versus kind of your potential. Right. And I think we can all say that all these guys have a ton of mm -hmm. potential and then your history with Greg and his system. Um, and I'm going to get to Greg's quote in a, in a second, but I wanted to get your initial, initial thoughts on on what happens if somebody plays well. Awesome problem to have. But I just I wonder how all the other dominoes fall once that gets decided, because way is not fit. Does Reina go central? You know, there's all these things, especially with Musa out. I think. What, what I, I guess what I, I kind of look back on is, is how I came into the team and, and when I finally felt like, oh, I'm good. I know where – I stopped thinking about everybody else. And, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you know, Heath was, was spot on when you're talking about, man, I, I, how, do I, how do I make this player want to play with me and, and where does the coach want me to go and should I take two touches here or should I – and you, you just – you start overthinking everything. And then mm -hmm. at one point I just said – I'm done thinking about everybody else. I, I know what I'm doing. I know what I got to go out there and do. That's it. I'm going to do me. And then all of a sudden you find yourself fitting in and everybody's looking to play you the ball and yeah. you, you just get into that groove. And I find that Sargent uh, and Jesus Ferreira are in that mode right now. They're, they're feeling that Pepe's still, you know, he's still got a lot going on. He's a new club adjusting. He's getting a new, uh, getting an opportunity again. But I, I, I look at these three, they're all going to the world cup in my opinion. Okay. I, I don't think anyone's coming off. They're all three are going. The only question is, does P folk get added and somebody gets taken off? But in terms of who's going to be the guy, I think Jesus Fer Ferreira is starting. Now, if Pepe comes in and lights it up, it's not going to be a shock to Greg Berhalter. He's going to be like, this is my guy. This is who I've gone right. with for a reason. He's just got out of form and now he's got his confidence back. Now, if Sargent goes in and kills it, he was the first starter in the World Cup qualifiers. Back, back so, on the road in El Salvador. Right, right, so, right, right. So it's just going to give him. Well, who do, I, who, do you, who do you want to see at number nine, Charlie? In this game, this first one against Japan, who do you want to see? In, in, because it's obviously very important in terms of building that dynamic with everybody else around you. So I'm just kind of curious who you would like to see. I, I would like to see Jesus Ferreira in, starting just because he's in form. He's earned it. I'm not a fan of, of taking somebody out if they're doing what they're asked to do, both with the, club, I agree with, that. with the club yeah. and the country. Mm -hmm. Now, the last World Cup qualifiers, I was harsh on him because I said, hey, you get those opportunities, you get one, you got to finish. That's right. it. Especially against a club, a, a team like Uruguay, a country like that, whether you're playing Holland in the next round or Senegal, you get out of the group, you're playing England, you get one chance, you have to finish. That is international soccer at its best. But... He still he went back to FC Dallas. He's crushed it. He's improving on his game. He's working on his weaknesses. He deserves to start. And now it's I want to see what he can do against the Japan. This is a, a, a country where he should get a lot more touches. He should he's great at creating space for himself. But now finish. Now if he mm -hmm. doesn't do that, mm -hmm. that's when you give the opportunity to Sergeant and Pepe. And do you take him like out at halftime, or do you you give him sixty? I'm a striker. You always give somebody six. <laughs> you, you, you don't need to be have, a striker to want four, six minutes, four, baby. 45 is harsh. It is I mean, harsh. I just, I'm just curious. I'm unless, just curious. Unless he's absolutely horrible and off the pace. Yeah. 45, well, sure. But yeah. 60. You, okay. You, you okay. give 60. All right. All right. There's Coach Coach Chuck D right there. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say Greg Berhalter's quote, and then Heath, you jump in on the strikers here. Greg said, the forwards we have in camp are different. Sergeant Pepe and Jesus aren't com comparable. I don't want to insinuate that Jordan Pifok isn't help, helpful to us, potentially. We continue to monitor players in the pool, and he also mentioned Brandon Vasquez at the end of this statement. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's interesting that he says they aren't comparable because I kind of think they are in some ways. I know they have little nuances and subtleties that make them different, of course, but there's a lot of similarities there as opposed to Jordan Pifok, who I think is definitely different than those other three guys. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> that is true. I, I don't think... The crappy part that is that, like, we continue to tell ourselves that he's scoring goals. Of course, he's going to go to the World Cup. But then you go, like, why wouldn't you just want him in the, in, in, in the team then? You could easily tell him, like, hey, you're probably not going to get any minutes in this camp. But, like, 
you are a circumstance yeah, you're around the group striker, yeah. and you're yeah. with the group and we need you in the group and integrated into the group because it's important right. um, optically. It also makes it make his job a lot easier if he was actually going to take him. Um, then you would just take him and not play him just like you do with most of the players that come <laughs> into camp. Uh, but, but yeah, I think this one is uh, I, I want to see Jesus Ferreira play in that because I think, I think the hard part is that striker is probably the closest position. Maybe Charlie feels differently that, that we're going to go with, whoever's got the hottest form. The problem is they both got hot form right now. So I give the edge to uh, Jesus Ferrer. Now, Josh Sargent is doing it and sort of revitalize his career. And we've seen the tools and the energy that he brings. Both are willing to press. Both are willing to defend, which I think is a strength for us. But I, I'm, I'm guessing the nod goes to uh, Jesus Ferrer at this point. Okay. Now, one of the things I wanted to bring up with both of you is that these are really important minutes, obviously. We got 180 official minutes. I know we'll probably get some behind the behind the scenes friendlies leading up to to the world cup or hopefully we will but but i don't think so by the way the last you game don't think so? i guess there's only a well, week we right? play we play what's our what's our first uh match day is the 19th 20th we play the 21st against wales is our first day okay first yeah, day is yeah. 21st against wales so maybe maybe there could be somewhere along the way because i know that last match day is the 12th or 13th weekend is the last club match day and then they go into and camp. The so Ross if you're arriving announced 14th, on the ninth on the ninth but if you're going into camp on the 13th or 14th after the weekend uh, as a team, I'm, I'm assuming they're all meeting up somewhere and flying together or something yeah. like that. But if you're, if you're doing that, or maybe because it's there, you wouldn't, you would go direct, but like, either way you would have the 13th to effectively the 19th to find an opponent or a match. So say somewhere 15th, 16th, like that, where you could get a match in. Um, so maybe there, there, there's an opportunity for that there. I'm not really sure though. It's interesting because we had a closed door friendly in Germany. And when we were there in Hamburg, uh, ahead of our first group stage game, I believe we played Senegal. Uh, and that was a good game for us for, for a lot of different reasons. But but it was important to get that kind of that rusty, that game like rustiness out before that first whistle blew. So I think it's important for us to have a game that isn't an ele- of, of, you know, inter squad 11 to 11. It's against somebody else. You're preparing for it in a, in a similar way that you would potentially prepare for a World Cup game. Obviously, apples and oranges, but you guys know what I'm trying to say. Uh, what else I like about this 180 minutes and what I think is really important is how we move as a group with or without the ball. I know this is going to get soccer geeky on everybody, but. I've seen some Nerd. comments on the well, I've seen some comments on the internet about how you can't run a national team like a club team, but I feel like when it comes to clean uh, to, to, to team shape, I want us to be as close to a club team as goddamn possible. Because for example, if plan A, let's say we're attacking and plan A isn't on, how quickly can we adapt and change to plan B? Now that's also that's individually, but also collectively, can we recognize that situation and then pivot quickly and and some that's that's going to be the game the transition is going to be where we have a lot of success and we have the players that are very good in transition so how quickly can we we transition and also obviously without the ball let's say our first line of pressure is broken which is going to happen of course you know are we prepared to solve that or, or as a group or is it just going to be like gut reactions where everybody's just trying to chase things down and close things down which is going to happen too at times, but how organized are we behind the ball when things aren't necessarily going our way? And how good are we at suffering? These are all things that I think we have to figure out quickly in 180 minutes. And Weston McKinney actually came out in his press conference and said that the team struggled in transition. And it's something they're working on when they struggled against Morocco and Uruguay. He, he, this is his quote, when the ball gets switched to the other side or our press gets broken down, we just have to track back and get behind the ball again, which sounds just more like an energy thing than anything else. So he said that's one of the things that we're concentrating on in training and just building out and playing and having confidence to find those balls that maybe aren't the easiest to find, but most effective. And in general, I guess, just to make sure our chemistry is intact, mm-hmm. which I don't think has ever been a real problem, but always good to have the guys in and talking about it. So so when any, was... any thoughts Any thoughts on my soccer geekiness? Because yeah, Charlie, I mean... you know that this is this is super important crap, you know? Yeah. That, that we can laugh off and, and give me a hard time, but but if we don't have this stuff locked down, it's going to be really difficult for us to have success. Yes, and I, and I would say when pl- when teams are able to hit that long switch, it's because the guy who's in the switch has has time. Right. So if he has time to hit that switch, that means guys are dropped off or they're out of position, and then right. naturally everyone does have to recover and get back. But it's how how quick do you re- recover and where are you recovering to? Because you mm-hmm. can't just run back to run back. Again, it's once that ball switches, does everyone, you know, in terms of locking them into that quadrant of the pitch and then knocking off each each outlet. So uh, I feel like everyone knows exactly what they need to do. It's, it, it, they've had enough time in Greg's system. They know how to operate. Now it's just getting the, the right group of players, the 11 that you're going with, and sticking with that 11. And, and then let everything take, take care of itself. I'm more curious about 
his quote on on the midfield position in terms of who's replacing Musa because he he basically listed every single midfielder there. <laughs> it, it wasn't like, oh yeah, Aronson and Reyna, I could definitely see that going, which he did say, but then he also said, yeah, Luca De La Torre can play there, Malik Tillman can play there. <laughs> so it's like, okay, I just want to, in this situation, I want to see Aronson playing there alongside McKinney and Adams. He's going to be more advanced. And then Gio Reyna, who will naturally come inside as well. Uh, and Aronson uh, can float outside because that's that interchange sure. we always talk about in the movement. I think with that movement and Christian Pulisic, they'll be able to generate chances off of combining, playing off of one another. And then that that's one way to really get at Japan. Yeah, no, I, I actually like that lineup a lot. Uh, so, we, so Matt Turner's already been announced. We mm -hmm. got Sammy Vines, uh, Zimmerman, Long. I'm going to say that Reggie Cannon gets to start. And then we have uh, Adam. You think Dest is on the bench? Oh, no, sorry. Des is probably going to play. Sorry, I forgot. I always think he's hurt. So, okay. so you know what? Des is going to start. Sorry. And then we have uh, McKinney and, and Adams. And I agree with you with Aronson or Gio Reyna. They're interchangeable. Aronson or, yeah, Reyna out wide and Ferreira and Christian Pulisic. Uh, Heath, any, any changes to that lineup? Yeah, I think my, my lineup is going to be uh, same back line with Dest. Uh, obviously, uh, that's uh, assuming all, all four of those players are, are fit after training today going into the match mm -hmm. um, because there are always just knocks that you're managing when you come into, to, in, into camp. But um, then I'm, I'm going to go uh, McKinney, Adams, and De La Torre in the midfield. And wow. then I've got Reyna starting right. up top. I've got, uh, and then where I get into where I get into a little bit of the complications are are so no Aronson, no. That's uh, that's not what I that's not saying what I want. I'm saying this is what I think it will be based on 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 just how I think it's going to come together based um, on the text he's getting from players inside camp. <laughs> I, uh, and then and then <laughs> I will not I will not confirm or deny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then right, and then right. I'm I think we've got uh, people will go uh, ballistic if Jesus Fer on the pitch. Jesus Ferreira and then um and then on on Christian Pulisic. I, the, the, Christian Pulisic. Yeah. Um, yeah. But again, people will go I, absolutely bonkers if Brandon I, Anderson is not in the starting 11. I yes. promise you, though, I have a feeling it's not going to be as best 11 y uh, as you think it would be going into this into this I, first game. I could see Gio Reyna being a super sub in this one. That would be the one that I wouldn't be surprised about given his history. Same. But but so Aaron, it's either Aaronson and Pulisic with then then De La Torre in, in the middle. But I, people, I don't think Reyna is going to be. People are saying Mark is, is my spot. Mark, Mark, I. I publicly know Mark way too much for him to tell me anything. He's the one that I've got. I got to go to his friends uh, and and have just enough distance. Uh, to try I'll, to I'll raise my hand and admit I was digging around uh, for for the roster and I couldn't or the starting lineup and I couldn't get it. It's tough because like like Charlie said at the beginning of the show with with justifying things, you can justify anything in these final 180 minutes. Logic yeah. tells us these are prep games, right? You need to be able to do it. But like prep prep games, we're still two months out from the World Cup. You know how much can change. In that period, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So you can go with your best eleven, which we already know we don't have available in this camp, in theory, and uh, or you can actually be looking at a few different options that you know you're going to have to play in the World Cup and don't know are they the guy or are they not. You know, there's yeah. there is a million ways like you could you could you could sell any sort of narrative. <laughs> for these games. We got 180 minutes for the vibes, everybody. We're just going <laughs> to yeah. see what the vibes look like and hope for the goddamn best once we play Wales on November 21st. All right, my prediction for this game, and then obviously after the break, we're going to get into some other stuff, but that's not going to include me. I have to bounce, unfortunately. Uh, Charlie's yacht is waiting for me. I'm going to go for a ride. <laughs> that's amazing. But uh, I'm, I'm going to say 2-1 to the U.S. I think uh, we're going to score first from you wagerers out there, plus 130 for the U.S. to score first. We'll probably hit them on a set piece because why not? Uh, predictions from you, Charlie. I think the U.S. wins 2-1. As yeah, well. same. Look at me and Charlie. Yeah, handsome yeah. guys. I, I, thinking you know alike. guys, yeah. let's make it a let's make it the trilogy. We, yes! we're the, the trifecta. I'm going with two one. Also, I don't see this team. Like, it's hard because I, I see them being punished at some point in the game, right? Uh, and I think this team wakes up from those types of things. But I also think that we we've got a, a, an attack and and a, and a belief right now that that's going to get goals. I just don't know if we're three one or two one. Going to be able to defend. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, deep down, I want to say probably two two, but I'm going two one because I got to man stars and strikes. I, I have faith. I have faith in this group. <laughs> 
It's a faith, faith, yeah, faith, 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 you can't miss that. You can't stoke this whole thing up over text messages. Yeah, in the group chat, man, bounce. trying to wind us all Why, up and then you, bounce. No, I, you can't, I thought you, you guys could talk no, about it. Listen, no. listen. You, listen. you were, you were the most charged over this. Don't I was charged. So okay, give, first of all, give us your take no, before you bounce. Okay, Go. my my take was that he has in this book about how Thomas Tuchel was yelling at him before that, you know, the goal he scored against Real Madrid in the semifinals. That he heard Thomas Tuchel say a goddamn complete sentence before he made a split second decision. <laughs> And I just don't buy what he's selling. Now, I do think it's plausible that he heard Tuchel say that earlier in the game, and now he's kind of misremembering when that happened. But you guys know, first and foremost, you can't hear coaches from the sideline. And second, you definitely can't hear him screaming. You can at the, Rev, at the Rev Stadium. You can for sure. You can hear <laughs> oh, it. Hey, 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 hey. Mind, you, mind you, this was COVID time, right? Yeah. So okay, there are no fine. fans. And but he's second, still not giving out a complete second, sentence. It's because you're Come a center on. back. You don't uh, really get instructions. No, no, I, I no. can tell Listen, you. I, I think he got I've that heard, instruction, but it didn't coaches. happen right before the play. Come I can on. hear coaches yelling, you know, tuck no, in or press or move here. I, you can I hear that. Know. All right. You know what? You guys can talk about that some more after the break. You can talk about how Bundesliga is calling out Greg Berhalter for not calling out Jordy Pifok. You can talk about the UEFA Super Cup potentially coming to the U.S. That's pretty wild. And you can also mention that Wales are losing right now to Belgium. Two to but zero, but I am forget. out, everybody. No, you forgot that Tuchel was yelling in German, and then and Christian picked it up. He said, oh, "Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah." yeah. <laughs> you guys just keep running with whatever you want. But, you got uh, it. Fair play to Christian Pulisic for writing the book before. Enjoy me. my boat. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna enjoy your boat. <laughs> All right, we're gonna take a break. We'll be right back right after this. Don't go anywhere. The UEFA Champions League. Nine months of heart stopping, hold your breath, acceleration. While Mbappe shines in the city of lights, Benzema's racking up the hat tricks, and the Reds want Mo Magic in Liverpool. This ain't amateur hour. This is the best of the best of the best. This is the UEFA Champions League. Stream every match live on Paramount Plus. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to In Soccer We Trust. Man, Jimmy just didn't want to go, huh? He just really wanted to. I mean, Good on you, Charlie, for calling him out. But then he wanted to stay past his welcome, and yes. you know, it's it's uh, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna continue into the second half of the show here. Uh, just you and I chatting. Uh, you know what what what's do you have any thoughts on on the Pulisic stuff? Does it feel like do you feel like there's a danger to him? You know, I've gotten a lot of random messages to people just sharing with me the things that they found uh, of quotes from from the book uh, of saying like this could hurt him with future clubs of being a guy who's sort of sharing what's in the locker room or being a guy who who is like taking things out of context or airing his dirty laundry um, while he's still just like, you know, barely what, 24 years old. I mean, do you think there's an, a, a potential effect on that or? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's all right to write books. I, I would say that it's better to keep. Sounds like you're writing a book, Charlie. That's what that sounds like. So um, um, no, eventually, but I'm done my career. Right. Yeah. I think for him, it's about keeping those things until you're done playing because you could burn bridges and mm -hmm. you know, in this game, in this world, anything can happen. It's such a small uh, world and, and you, you could maybe upset a coach, a player, a sporting director, whatever it is. And that could come back to, to, to haunt you. So I would say, wait, till you've done your career and he has so many years ahead of him. Like his story is not even close to being done. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm I'm happy that a player can have. Do you think it's like an outlet? Do you think it's an outlet that he's, yeah, he's doing I do. this? I mean, yeah. like for him to like kind of like move on it's, or like put it, like literally bookend a moment of his career. One hundred percent. I think it's one of those things where you, to get it off your chest, you, you you just write and you say, "Hey, this is one way to to deal with it." It's you know everyone has different levers to to deal with mental stress and and pressure, so this must be uh, one of his. Yeah, yours is smoking hookah still, or you, you don't smoke hookah anymore? Is that not no, a thing anymore? <laughs> no hookahs. Zero is that not hookahs. a thing anymore? Yeah. I feel like uh, it's not a thing anymore. Yeah. Some I people, I I've, I, in France, I don't think that's ever going away. That's yeah. a, that's a, like French players, they love to do that. Um, but yeah, I've seen some players and he's still doing it now. And I'm like, wow. Yeah. Now I know we covered a little bit of Pulisic. I'm assuming we 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 think he is a sure starter from now through the World Cup. I mean, clearly at the World Cup. But but do you think that there is a risk of of needing again to look elsewhere in the lineup just to know like okay, Christian Pulisic m would naturally play 90 minutes, but 
maybe he can't go 90 minutes in some game. Who else do you put there? And we haven't really looked mm-hmm. to that position much um, in terms of rotation or depth within the squad. And you've got a Bo- Jordan Morris. You've got a Paul Areola. We know Jordan Morris has generally been that 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 guy over time. But like yeah, but no. he also hasn't been at the level that we know Jordan Morris to be at in the, uh, in, 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 in past years. And Paul Areola, who's informed, but generally – uh, can 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 play both sides, but I mean, do you think that there's a, a reason to to tinker a little bit and try something else uh, in these games? No, but I would say he, you probably went from you can't sub him like he's a 90 minute player every game mm-hmm. to if he's not playing well. Now that that crosses your mind, 65, 70 minutes. I'm looking at Brian Aronson. Gio Reyna has played on the left. Brian Aronson has played on the left. Those guys. Are, you can easily switch to, to that position. And who knows? Maybe you you change the tactics depending on the game. And you need to make a sub. Maybe you put on two strikers, whatever it is. He he is not he's not in a position where he can't be sub now. Like that, that that's very plausible considering he's not playing and he's he hasn't been in good form. Interesting. You know, this uh, Misael Rom- Romero is saying that uh, he went to uh, order a jersey on the U.S. soccer store and there was 27 name suggestions. Uh, is there an assumption that the final 26 are already on that list? Charlie, I mean, a- actually, do you think this is a more accurate question? Because I think that's mm-hmm. that's that's tough to actually speculate on. But like, do you think that after this camp, two games or even say the, uh, even this first game, that were 24 of those 26 pending injuries and, and change, or can the final, can the, can the six weeks left or seven weeks left leading up to the world cup um, change that? Will club form really matter other than the players that may go a longer period from injury? Like, do you think any of that will matter? Or are we, are we nearly there? I'd say 23 names are cemented. Okay. 23. I think there's room for, for players coming on or off with with the last three spots because remember you touched on it uh, november 13th is the last weekend and the 21st this game starts typically in a world cup year in the summer you've got a camp and right. you've, you 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 call in 36 and i'd say of that 36 and there's only 23 spots probably 18 you could say for sure there's yeah. there's there's room to earn your spot in that camp now there's no room to earn any spot. We had 30 in 2010, obviously 26 players. You would normally have, you know, again, probably 36 players to be able to cut out those those extra three, mm-hmm. 10 players. There are a few that you know that are maybe injury reserve or going to be on the alternates list and right. probably don't have a shot. Um, but there are other ones that you would you you could you could work your way in and 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 way out, right? I always go back to like the Gooch thing, like you didn't know who was going to fit into that conversation, knowing where Gooch was at in terms of his recovery um, and other players in terms of like, how can they fit into this puzzle uh, to be able to contribute maybe uh, in multiple positions and things like that. So you're, you're thinking we're 23 of, of, of 26. So would you say beyond that, then is there a single player that you think play that, that this is make or break camp time for them? Is it an Ariola? Is it a, is it a Morris? Is it a, is it a Luca De La Torre or is it a, you know, somebody that could get minutes? Is it, is it one of the center backs? I'd say of this group. We got three right backs as well this camp. I mean, yeah. is there anybody uh, that, that can really boost their stock or or fall out if they don't have a top performance? I think Malik Tillman is in that in that conversation. I job. think Jordan Morris is in that conversation. I think Paul Ariola is in that conversation. Johnny Cardoso. I think Ariola is going, but... Um, Johnny Cardoso is in that conversation as a late mm-hmm. add-in. Then you have Eric Palmer Brown, Mark McKenzie, Joe Scally, and then I would say Reggie Cannon. The, the I think Yedlin's going. So mm-hmm. um, of the of those, I think those are the players right now that it's 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 everything's on the line for them in this camp. I think Sam Vines, if he has a really good camp, he's going to go to the World Cup because I don't. I I think that I I agree. I think that we've it's 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 been revealed enough to know that who you want and who you actually get at a World Cup in terms of health is is not um, always the case, and we know injuries happen in World Cups, every World Cup, right? In terms of like a knock or a little bump or a bruise or you know yellow card troubles or all these things, to be able to go to what you think are two players in every position that you know can do the job. Having said that, we didn't do that in 2010, um, but you had a Carlos Bocanegra who'd played at the club level at left back. You had Demarcus Beasley who was playing more at left back, so you had plenty of coverage of natural position players 
that could do the job at a, at a, at a World Cup level. And I think that's where where um, where he could fit into. And then that's where you start to maybe lose a a a Reggie Cannon because you've got two in that, uh, or you've got the depth there with. A, well, you got three because yeah. Tyler Adams played at right back. So oh, yeah, you know, I would so, I would I would be like I would my mind would be blown if we saw three right backs at the World Cup. Mm -hmm. That's fair. That's fair. Okay. Any final thoughts on on the lineup uh, that you expect for for the U.S. or or no, not necessarily what we're predicting to see, but somebody you want to mm -hmm. see or something you want to you want to you want to tinker with. I know we're talking about you know maybe no De La Torre and 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 putting another attacking minded player in there that's maybe a little more vertical. I know De La Torre has been great going forward and he's a fan favorite, but you know could it be a would it be better to have an Aronson or or a, or a Reina in there uh, just to have a look at it? By the way, I would like I, to see that. I think we're going to see a back four and a back, back three in this camp. And I know it's something that I wanted, but it's something that's continuing to make more and more sense to me in terms of a different type of play that we're going to have to be able to offer. And also, because we don't have a Robinson and Zimmerman, which I think we are pretty comfortable with, uh, regardless of form of their ability to work together and play together, that it might be better to have some coverage. Or maybe that plays better for a Serginho Dest or, or a Robinson who like to be higher up the field in a double pivot. Like the more I think about it, the more I think we're a back three team. Um, but we also never looked good and we kind of threw that away. We do first halves with it. We saw it in the Nations League and we switch away from it pretty quickly. So, But when I think about back threes, it gets your Richards on the field so you have more coverage. It gives you more... Mm -hmm more of your key players with with shared responsibility than than is than big responsibility what's your thought on that yeah I, I i think we could play a back three but chris richards would have to be healthy and then you're looking at uh cz uh camera carter vickers mark mckenzie and aaron long you know for that th that third uh center back spot but you you can play with serginio desk because serginio desk would thrive in a three three five two or He's best uh, in a three five two yeah yeah for sure but um, yeah, it'll be interesting uh, what what Greg decides to do and how how he does it within the game. Is it a halftime thing? Is it starting from that position? But ultimately, it's probably why he picked these two opponents because you can tinker in the game during the game and mix mm -hmm. things up to see how the players react to it. So I'd like to see Reyna uh, in in that central position uh, and see how that looks. But you know. Timo Wea is going to be a, a beast when he gets fit. That's a great option to have. We, we don't have have him in this camp, and then no Yunus Musa. So those are two massive pieces that we're not getting a chance to see mm -hmm. uh, how they look with this group. But um, yeah, I, I'm I'm excited. Uh, either way, what I want to see is the team having possession in the attacking half and movement, different ideas, being creative and not being so black and white. I, I want to see different ideas and movement and playing in behind, combining, taking shots from outside, whipping balls in, early crosses at the end, you know, end line crosses, different ways to break down Japan because that's what you're going to need because they are so organized. You know, when you yeah. play Japan, technically and tactically organized to the T. So you have to, you have to have ideas and creativity. Yeah. No, I, I think I think you're spot on there. And and when I think about just what we're trying to, to to get out of that. And we go back to the comments earlier in the show about, about running a national team, like a club team, because there are patterns of play that you want to be able to have, right? You need to be able to break things down. And one thing I always remembered from the national team and playing in the national team is it, what it was a lot of information, but it was never club team level information, right? Because you're playing with an elite level of players on the field that can understand at a higher level. That's just the reality of playing in the national team, right? And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes you play good, sometimes you don't. But there is a, an elite level of intuitive teamwork that happens on the national team that you have to adjust and react to in real time where you have a different level of, 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 of being a stakeholder in the outcome of a game versus a club team. You could, you could drill out all week long on how you're going to prep and beat the worst team or the best team in the Bundesliga versus the worst team in the Bundesliga, which we were all season long, right? You, you prepped mm -hmm. out to how you would get points against things and playing now with, with, with the national team, having more of these options, like you said, that fluidity, that movement, that creativity of when to take those chances, I think it's going to be really important to make teams even respect you that you can beat them or break them down in a number of ways. We don't want to just say, Hey, we get the ball wide. We whip it. in. otherwise we try to get set pieces and we whip it in. Right. That's a, it might work, uh, but I don't think we necessarily have the tools. We have some really, really talented, creative players. We just got to bring all that together. By, by the way, we haven't had 
most of those players together for most of qualifying. We've had pieces at different times. When I think about Gio Reyna and others, that'd be nice to figure out how we can get the most out of those players, which might shock us in terms of the lineup that we put out. You're spot uh, on. Let's, let's, uh, let's talk about the Bundesliga calling out uh, Greg Berhalter, former Bundesliga player. Gets called out by uh, the Bundesliga social channel, I want to say. It's not the Bundesliga themselves. Uh, it's not somebody in a board going like, what's Greg Berhalter doing? The social handle called out Greg Berhalter for the lack of uh, PFOC inclusion. And uh, what's your take on on uh, the admins going going rogue on some of these things, Charlie? You, you for it? I, I don't mind it. I mean, it, 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 it causes chatter. I, I want people talking about our, our sport and our team, our national team. So I have no problem with the Bundesliga digital team like coming at coming at the U.S. But ultimately, it means nothing. <laughs> it absolutely yeah. means nothing. They're, they're trying to promote, you know, they're trying to promote a player that's playing in their league. Uh, I get it. Um, and, and I mean, do they have a reason to? Yeah. I mean, the Bundesliga is one of the top, top teams, uh, leagues in the world. And he's on the top team in that league and he's doing well. So, yeah. um, yeah, but at the end of the day, Greg, Greg's like, nah, I'm not feeling him right now. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. I think it is good. And look, I, I have I have friends that run that are admins for for Bundesliga clubs and other clubs um, uh, <laughs> around the around the world, and their most viral moments or the things they get the most credit for are are creating the chatter, right? It's not an like it's a good hot take and it's solid and and I think it's good. So they whoever it was, whether they took it down or they left it up, they uh, they got the W for that uh, because we're talking about it on the show, which means we're not the only ones. You know, it's it's reached the 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 farthest places. So. That, that that's a win for them, but it, it is what it is. All right, and finally for for a final topic, uh, Charlie, UEFA Super Cup potentially in the U.S. with a format change. Obviously, that would include in Major League Soccer team. That doesn't seem to make sense. It, it, I would think that it would include uh, Champions League winning team, but from what I read, it was a, a MLS champion. You mean like a Concacaf Champions League winner, which yeah. is the Seattle Sounders at this point. Yeah, but versus like generally versus MLS like champion I, I, MLS, MLS champion. But I think gotcha. it, from what I read, it said MLS champion. Mm -hmm. And then it would be Europe, um, Europe, Asia, and uh, I can't remember what the other one was, but um, no, it uh, was it was UEFA Champions League winner. It was yeah. the Europa League winner and the okay. Europa Conference League winner. Oh, so those three winners. That's what it was. Yes. OK. And then an MLS champion. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's it's very typical of the U.S. to be like, no, no, sure, sure. You can have a game. There. Yeah, as over, long as, all over. And then they go, as, as long as one of our as long as our kids get invited to the, to the party, you know, yeah, uh, exactly. You know, I'm, oh, I'm oh, all for it. That's awesome. Of it's course awesome. you can. Are you You're kidding Charlie me? Davies. You got a big old backyard. Of course you can have the birthday party at Charlie Davies' house. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you just got to let my kids on the bouncy castle. You know what I mean? 100%. Like, uh, you know, there's things. There's no free lunch. Um, okay, so conference, Champions League, Europa League, and an MLS uh, champion. A very bizarre format to add the MLS team. Um, but but do you think this is a good thing? We saw in the past with Relevant Sports Group bringing a lot of these games. It faded out over time. Um, mm -hmm. They were not official. They were friendlies. But like you always knew that like, I know Ronaldo or or who, Messi or whoever is. I know they're on the poster, but I also know that they're playing with their national team all summer, and they're not going to be in this game. I'm going to see a bunch of 19 year olds. Now, for me, you like young players. You want you want to see that. But like for the average fan that feels a little bit cheated by these teams coming over, do you think an official competition in the U.S. is a good thing? Do you think that's good for the the the, the growth of the sport? Do you think it's just? I mean, yes. Do you have any? Yeah. What, I mean, what's your what's your what's your initial takeaways from from something like that? I mean, La Liga was trying to get Real Madrid Barca in a league match to be played in Miami. So, I mean, that gives you an idea of what. You know who the, protested, though? It was the small team. It was um, whoever uh, Barcelona was going to be playing in Miami. They were like, you're taking away, like, we get two big revenues a year, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we get Real Madrid when they come to town. We get Barcelona when we come to town. You're going to take our Barcelona game because it's not Barcelona's home games. It's their away games. And I'm trying to remember who it was that they were playing against. Um, and they were like, no, you're taking away. All of this from our fans, our from money. our people, from <laughs> yeah. our money. You're taking that away from us. We're not, we're not, we're not participating in that. We get two big days a year, and you're going to take one of them. No, thank you. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of protest around bringing official competition because if you're Major League Soccer, you're like, no, 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 no. If you're U.S. Soccer and it doesn't benefit you, you're like, no, 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 no. We're not taking. You know, we're like, this is within. You, you want to get these fans? Go through the internet. You know, you're right, not coming right. in here and planting a flag here because you're setting a precedent that everybody can come in here and gobble up the fastest growing fan bases and also household incomes and all these things that come with the U S fan base. I could see there being a lot of 
complications with that as well moving forward. And, and that's all they see. Uh, yeah. UEFA sees the money that's that the sleeping giant that's the United States when it comes to 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 the sport. And so, of course, they want to have their their prime time teams and players come over and play in an official competition because they know that that's going to generate a, an added revenue that they didn't see coming and a lot of money, a lot of followers that come mm -hmm. with that. So, MLS if they were able to get into there as well, I mean, they, they, that's great for players. That's great for uh recognition for the league and, and obviously your brand. Hey, so, we better open up those salary caps though. If we're going to compete, you know, you got better, that right. You better open up those salary. You better say, okay, for this day only. <laughs> 10 allowed BPs allowed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're bringing your, bring in any players you want for this type of game. No, I think we could co compete at conference league and, and you know, um, but these are like winners of these, right. You're talking about yes. Roma. Yeah, like, we're talking about you know uh, top, Roma top, conference league. We're not league. talking about competing in the conference league. We're talking about the winner of the conference league, which could have won the Europa League type of teams. Yes, and a lot the Europa of League winner could could have maybe won the Champions League or have gone deep in the Champions League. Yeah, exactly. So, so I mean, it's 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 certainly something. Um, and that's and that's why you're seeing all of the teams uh, teams and leagues from uh, from Europe uh, open up offices in the U.S. because like. The way the revenue structures, business models work in the U.S. are so different than in Europe, right? You know what it was like at your clubs? Like there was a like there was a ten percent difference that you could drive in growth in these well-established clubs that they're at their ceilings. Like if you're a big club like Barcelona, like you, the only way to make money is to get out of Spain mm -hmm. and go get money from other countries, and that's why you see a lot of the opportunities there. And if you're UEFA, it's the same thing. Like let's let's spread out our 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 revenue. So it'll be interesting to see if that comes to life. Obviously. There's just nothing but rumors living on the internet right now, uh, and we'll find out more um, as 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 things happen. But um, obviously, we're getting to the end of the show, Charlie. Any final thoughts? U.S. taking on uh, I almost said Jamaica, Japan um, in this one. A very are, early are, morning kickoff. Morning. Are we do, are we doing an early show? Or are we sticking with the one p.m. time? We are going to do when we're going to do the recap of the game. So yeah, uh, when the game like ends, right after yeah. the game. Yeah, I think that okay. actually ends up being a little bit later than our normal show no, right early. no no much earlier. Five, oh yeah so so the game starts at around 7 30 eastern i want to say okay yeah so we're doing 10 30 eastern yeah. time um wait uh, our producer 8 8 30 oh the kickoff of the game is 8 30 start time we're going to do a 10 30 recap okay. eastern time so 7 30 pacific time recapping that game and then obviously we'll make sure that we're getting into the previews and whatnot in the future for 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 the second game against so it's early Saudi. for you yeah it's early for me but you know what the u.s i mean it's it's early is all relative charlie when you got a bunch of kids it's like maybe a 20 minute difference to be able to watch the game so true in fact it's kind of easier because i can actually get through it before any, anyone even goes to school but any final thoughts charlie uh to wrap up the show knowing that this is a big 90 minutes we got 180 minutes left to play potentially another 90 or a closed door whatever it might be um but um yeah final thoughts uh, I'm just excited. More important uh, than the win tomorrow, I just want to see us dominate possession in the attacking half and create uh, different types of chance. I want to see variety in the attack, the attacking third, and and I'm good. Mm, what like about that. you? I like that. No, I mean for me, it, it, it's it's similarly like I want to see us play with courage. I think we saw some of that against against uh, uh, Morocco and Uruguay. We saw some courage. We saw some like. We lived in this bubble for so long about CONCACAF, and it's just so, you and I both know, it's just so different the way you prep for a CONCACAF, the way you execute, the way you get results. I almost always feeling unfulfilled as a player, as a creative player, as an attacking player. I almost always felt unfulfilled in CONCACAF games other than the result. Get a point, get three points, you're happy. But you're like deep down, you're like, man, that is not the way that I want to play. Uh, and that's the way you do it. Now we're getting a chance to allow them to kind of take the guardrails off and test a few things. So I want to see the team play with confidence um and courage um for sure in these games but that is it for us we appreciate all of you and again the comment section was popping off again popping i appreciate all of you guys the debates the comment i don't even think you guys are listening to us you guys are just fighting with each other sometimes in there and i appreciate all of that having those conversations you guys are the ones that make this thing um tick that make this thing hum that make this thing fun for all of us and to keep this thing growing so i appreciate all of you and on behalf of myself charlie chuck wagon davies jimmy cream cheese trash can conrad who left us uh, at halftime as he does and our producers Des and Alex that is it from in soccer we trust and we will see you guys tomorrow <laughs>